I think we met before. Yeah. 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 Maybe in Japan? Oh, no, actually in, uh, at the Yub building. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Okay, sure. Uh, Are we... It's about that kind of critical infrastructure protection. Yeah. Good morning and welcome. Corral my panelists over here. Yeah, I see. What's the matter where I sit? Just one second. Bobby? So good morning, I'm Sharon Squassoni. I direct the Proliferation Prevention Program here at CSIS. Uh, welcome, so glad everyone could make it here on this very cold morning. Um, I would like to make a few administrative comments before we jump into the substance, and that is please turn your cell phone ringers off. Uh, we are webcasting this at the same time. Um, and uh, this is on the record. So it is my great um, pleasure and pri privilege to welcome you here today to our event on the nonproliferation implications of Japan's fuel cycle decisions. I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a complicated topic. But um, we uh, have been involved for the past, I don't know, year and a half or so, uh, CSIS, the Proliferation Prevention Program, and Hitatsubashi University, Dr. Nobu Akiyama, um, on this project that uh, sought to bring together Japanese and US experts um, to discuss how Japan is making its fuel cycle decisions um, and what that means for the nonproliferation regime. Before I jump into my slides, which I'm not sure, Bobby, I know how to get to, they'll take. Look at that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers. So um, uh, on my, immediately to my left, Emma Chandler Avery, who's a specialist in Asian affairs at the Congressional Research Service. Uh, and um, Emma has also held positions in the State Department, policy planning, and uh, on the Korea desk. And Emma and I have worked together, I'm happy to say, um, at the Congressional Research Service. Following Emma, we'll have Dr. Nobu Masa Akiyama, uh, who is a professor at the School of International and Public Policy at Hitatsubashi University. Um, Nobu is also an adjunct research fellow for the Center for Promotion of Disarmament and Nonproliferation at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Um, Nobu is, has also had his finger on the pulse of all of these issues related to Japan's nuclear energy and nonproliferation um, for many years and has served um, as a, an expert on a, a lot of panels. We don't have them listed here in your bio, uh, but the, I guess the, the Fukushima Commission um, was one of the most notable ones. Uh, and, and then following Nobu, we'll hear from Dr. Steve Fetter, uh, who is a professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. And um, Steve is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and most recently uh, in the US government, he was the assistant director at large in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. So Steve has seen all of these issues from the inside and the outside. I am just going to briefly walk you through what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the genesis of this project, and uh, then we're going to move through what's happening in Japan. I'm going to throw a few slides up there on the technical issues and what's happening in the fuel cycle, um, and then we're going to hear from Emma on the domestic, political, and economic context in Japan right now. Then we'll move to Nobu, who will talk about the Tokyo workshop. Um, Steve will make his presentation. Uh, and then we'll have a general discussion and then open it up to you all. So um, as you know, I mean, I see a lot of expert faces in this audience. Um, 
Japan, which had 54 operating nuclear power reactors before the accident of Fukushima. Uh, all of them stopped subsequently. Um, and now we're looking at a situation where only a couple uh, permission has been given for the two reactors, um, the Sendai one and first and one and two reactors, to restart both the NRA permission and the local government permission just recently. Um, on the enrichment side, um, Japan has been moving over to new centrifuges uh, at uh, the Rakasha plant, and uh, that's moving ahead, scheduled for, um, actually, I think that says 2016, it should be 2017, sorry, typo in there. Uh, and then the, the biggest question is the Rakasha reprocessing and restart. Uh, initially, that was, um, or more recently, it was scheduled to start up in March 20 of 2016, following all the, the completion of the safety inspections. And now that has been, um, sorry, that was going to be start up in 2014. Now that's been pushed to 2016. And then the, lastly, on the fast reactor program uh, in the basic energy plan, uh, the Manju fast reactor is now sort of been been designated for research uh, and development. Whoops, this is very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> sensitive here. OK, there we go. So this is just a diagram um, of the nuclear power plant. Sorry, a little bit of my scribbling is on there. Um, there are a lot of complicated, I'm sure most of you have access to that, a lot, a lot more complicated information about which ones um, will be restarting when and which ones have uh, applied for um, uh, permission to restart. There's a lot of information up on our website, and uh, there's a, a background, uh, actually a policy perspectives that we left out in the front, and then a background discussion paper available on our website. I don't want to bore you to death with all of that. Um, I just wanted to put a little bit of information up there. This is the status of the review of compliance with the new regulatory requirements. <coughs> um, one of the big issues we're going to talk about is you know, when these reactors restart, and I think some of them will, which of them will be fueled with mixed oxide fuel, uh, because that has a definite impact on Japan's plutonium uh, stockpiles. So you can see in Kyushu, the Kyushu utility Sendai 1 and 2 got local permission. Uh, to restart on November 7th. Um, this is at, at the end of September. The Japan Atomic Energy Commission released the plutonium management status in Japan. Um, this is uh, some slides that JNFL shared with me recently. Um, plutonium, th there's been some discussion, you know, why did the plutonium go up? There's some, some uh, reasons for that. But basically, the, the bottom line is, you know, there's, there's 10 tons um, in Japan and uh, 36 tons outside in the UK and uh, France. That's been separated. OK. Um, just briefly, the Tokyo workshop, our aim was to bring together experts to explore alternative paths for Japan's fuel cycle. So we had half Japanese experts, half US experts, some from industry, some government, former government, and some non-proliferation experts. And really, the aim was to say, OK, these decisions are quite complicated. How can we make each other, both sides, understand each other a little more? Um, and we broke down into different groups that explored uh, different alternative strategies. Um, we have, I'm wondering if this link will work. Let's see. Just to show you on our website, it's working. <coughs> Slowly. <laughs> um, we have a variety of products, including a series of interviews that both Nobu and I did. Um, Nobus are in Japanese, mine are in English. <laughs> 
Um, and they are, the Japanese ones have uh, English uh, subtitles. What? <coughs> I'm going to wait for the program to respond. You think it's going to work? No, you cannot. OK. Well, if you go to our CSIS website on the proliferation prevention page and go to this set of topics post Fukushima, uh, you'll be able to access the interviews. Um, so we did a series of, so, so we had discussion papers that everybody completed. We had, um, and this workshop report, which is what you found outside, um, and then these interviews with individual experts. So you'll get the full range of views from, um, you know, people who are sh straight from industry uh, or uh, from the nonproliferation area. Let's see. Some of the questions we considered, um, what were the drivers of spent fuel management and fuel cycle decisions? What were some of the Japanese public perceptions? Japanese public is overwhelmingly concerned with safety, not non-proliferation. Um, you could probably say the same of US, of the US public. Um, we considered the disconnect between the perceptions of what was desirable versus um, what would actually happen. So I asked each of the experts to say, OK, you tell me, what's, your, what's the best outcome for Japan's nuclear fuel cycle from your perspective? And what do you think is really going to happen? Um, and we also talked about the issue of latent nuclear weapons capability, and then actions that Japan could take to improve transparency. OK. So, I'm going to step aside here and let all of my experts speak. And we'll start with Emma Chandler Avery uh, first on some of the domestic um, uh, considerations. Good morning, everyone. Um, before I start, I have to issue a quick disclaimer that nothing that I say here represents CRS and certainly not the US Congress. Um, I'm going to be, um, I think, Fairly brief, I just want to give a basic political scene setter uh, for what's going on in Japan right now and just a few of my observations about how the nuclear power um, issue plays in Japanese politics. Um, I have to say we're looking at a significant change from just a few weeks ago. Um, a few weeks ago, I think that Abe was seen as very firmly in control and, and well positioned to pursue um, a pretty ambitious agenda that he laid out. And just within the week, we have seen uh, the Japanese economy um, fall into a recession. Um, the LDP-backed candidate um, in Okinawa lost in the uh, gubernatorial election. Um, and snap elections have been called by Abe. I think there are very um, sound political reasons um, to call this election right now. And most of the observers think that the LDP coalition will remain in control. Um, and probably extend um, the length of its rule. However, um, coming out of this, I think there's also strong potential for Abe to be in a somewhat weakened political position, um, which um, is going to bring up some challenges in terms of tackling his agenda. Um, right now, the biggest challenges that I see are, of course, uh, first and foremost, um, dealing with what's a, a foundering economy. Um, pursuing negotiations and an agreement um, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is particularly important to the US as well, um, and trying to um, establish some of the structural reforms that he's um, promised as part of the Abenomic strategy. Um, he's also going to need, um, I think, extra um, political capital to deal um, with pushing forward the realignment of um, US military troops in Okinawa, and particularly the relocation of a controversial Futenma air station there. And then, of course, the topic of today, um, restarting the 48 um, nuclear reactors that have been um, idled in Japan. With, this, um, with limited political capital, he's going to have to prioritize a bit um, among all of these issues. We've already seen um, him lose what was um, expected to be sort of his chief spokesperson for restarting nuclear reactors with the loss of Yuko Obuchi from his cabinet, um, who resigned just a few weeks ago. And she was seen as being a, a really strong potential advocate for this, um, having a good public face 
um, you know, young, telegenic mother of young children um, was seen as, as possibly um, being, being a, a force to try and, and uh, sway a skeptical public um, on restarting these reactors. Um, so far in the restart, um, I think there is a strong sense among observers that the government has largely um, left these jobs to, first, first of all, the, the Nuclear Regulation Agency, um, as well as local gov um, government officials um, to try and make the case to their publics. And there um, may be a sense that there's a need for more um, national level advocacy um, if you're going to, to convince uh, the Japanese public of this need. Um, in terms of, uh, I want to make a couple of comments on um, the nature of how this topic plays in Japanese politics because it's actually, it's somewhat slippery and a bit hard to quantify and, and very hard to predict in Japanese politics. On the one hand, um, the issue of nuclear power um, is, is deep and underlying and, and very emotional among the Japanese public, um, particularly post Fukushima. Um, they brought out the largest um, public demonstration since the Vietnam War era um, in opposition to nuclear power. Um, there's also been very powerful figures who have emerged um, in, in opposition to restarting reactors, um, including former Prime Minister Koizumi, um, who basically came out of retirement when he'd been very quiet um, um, to support Japan going to, to zero. There are at least three other former um, prime ministers who also came out with a similar position. On the other hand, despite this very powerful public current, um, the LDP, who have been seen as, as relatively pro-nuclear, um, have maintained this stance and been elected by pretty wide margins um, in the past two elections, December 2012 and July 2013. In the July 2013 upper house elections, actually, um, the LDP won every constituency that had um, a nuclear plant um, within its boundaries. Um, and consumers are, are, it seems, paying the price here, literally paying the price um, with, with um, rising energy cost. yet it doesn't seem to have really swayed poll numbers. There's, there's other topics that seem to be um, more on the minds of voters uh, when they go into the, to the polling booths. Um, the government um, throughout this time um, have maintained this um, commitment to restarting reactors. Um, however, um, the National Energy Plan that was released um, this past spring didn't set actual targets, um, didn't define the energy portfolio percentages as a goal. Um, in terms of coalition politics within Japan, um, I think that Nobu can probably speak to this. Um, um, with more expertise, but it seems that Komeito has sort of a, a moderately less pro-nuclear stance, um, at least according to their party platform. Um, but at this point, they seem to be taking the path of um, least political resistance and haven't, haven't made a big issue of it so far. Um, this is all probably news to you who are uh, not news to you, people who are more experts in this field, but it's very interesting in Japan, I think, how it's not quite a NIMBY issue there. I mean, with some important exceptions, local communities, because of federal subsidies, support the restart. Um, but I think it's beyond five kilometers um, around a reactor. Um, there's, you know, the more public opposition looking at, you know, basically roughly 60% of the public um, are opposed to, to the restart of these plants. Um, because there seems to be sort of a a gentleman's agreement that mayors and governors have an unofficial veto, it's a really complicated patchwork of, of different political interests at play when you're looking at, at restarting at specific um, facilities. Um, I think that the situation is now somewhat tenuous um, in terms of, of restarting these reactors. Um, there's, of course, a strong need for Abe to um, reduce uh, the trade deficits because of these, the very high cost of, of imports of, of fossil fuels to make up the difference here. Um, and I think there's also politically the risk of this being a real sleeper issue and something that, that will sway the public um, in larger numbers to, to support um, alternatives to the LDP 
And that, of course, is particularly so if there is some other accident. And that could, you could really see a dramatic turn um, if we see even something that's not um, up to the severity of what happened on 311. I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much for your attention. OK, I think we'll, we'll take questions at the end. So I'd like to Can I speak there? invite um, oh, Nobu a, up to the podium, whichever you'd like. Oh, uh, I need to show a slide, actually. No, also, I need to see the slide. OK, so I think that might work better. OK, don't fall off the stage, please. Thank you. <laughs> so Sharon, thank you very much for organizing uh, this uh, uh, panel. And uh, I'm, I really enjoyed working with Sharon on this project. Although I think many people have a pro, uh, trouble in pronouncing my university's name as well as my own name, uh, Hitotsubashi. So I hope that the, you know, this is uh, the something takeaway for you, the Hitotsubashi, that you know, please remember my university, actually. Uh, so the, my talk is um, uh, the, uh, some outcome from uh, the, our workshop in Tokyo, and also my take on sort of perception gap between the Japanese and American participants on the uh, factors uh, which may decide the, uh, the future or fate of a Japanese nuclear fuel cycle policy. So uh, you know, to, to continue or not to continue, that's a problem uh, for our you know, the, uh, fuel cycle policy. And I think I'm going to skip the most of them because Sharon had already, has already talked about but um, it's a current status. And I would like to just touch upon the, uh, the basic energy plan. And then uh, uh, you know, th this identifies nuclear energy as a kind of base law energy source. So, uh, and uh, the government made clear its position to restart the nuclear power plants. But uh, the, in reality, the pace of the revelation on the safety requirements is rather slow with only limited uh, capabilities of uh, nuclear regulatory uh, uh, agency. And then, uh, uh, so hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, the government was not so kind of pushing hard as say, saying that this uh, deliberation and safety standard is, it must be independent from the decision uh, of the, the restart or not. And then uh, uh, government, is not really taking a position on this uh, safety uh, standard. So with only limited capacity of uh, regulatory uh, agency, I think uh, the pace for the restart is now pretty much delayed. And uh, um, so that's what Sharon said earlier about it. And then uh, uh, um, on the fuel cycle policy, uh, currently, as Sharon said, the, uh, the Rokasho uh, reprocessing plant is delayed. The, they, uh, the company announced a 22nd uh, announcement of a delay in the operation. And then it says they will complete the construction in March 2016. Then they have to have another sort of a double check on their safety requirements. So it takes several months more after the, uh, the, con the com completion of construction. And then uh, they have invested approximately 20 billion US dollars in this plant. So it is something you know, too big to lose for the industry, in, in fact. And then, uh, of course, the plutonium stockpile is a big problem for, uh, a big concern for the international audience. And in particular, from the perspective of nuclear proliferation or security concerns. Uh, then further problem probably is that the prospects for the, uh, the first media reactor research project, Monju, ha has relatively uh, uncertain and clear future what would happen with this Monju. And uh, if we see this uh, nuclear fuel cycle paradigm and technology paradigm, then uh, you know, completion of a closed fuel cycle is the, the goal. But uh, at this moment, I think the Japanese program must uh, reconcile with the, the MOX uh, fuel cycle at this moment. And then uh, we have in, in the, uh, the workshop discussed on the variables that will affect Japan's uh, plutonium balance. So uh, you know, the, maybe this uh, slide we focus on the issue of technical aspect, how many and when light water reactors will, 
will restart, and the amount of reserved capacity in the spent fuel pool. So, uh, in fact, the spent fuel pool, uh, you know, capacity on site of each reactor is getting full, and uh, I think approximately 70% of the capacity is now full. So, if we start, uh, we we have see the restart of uh, nuclear power plants without appropriate. Uh, sort of a treatment of a removal of spent fuel uh, into the other locations. Uh, so there may be, uh, you know, the utilities will, will face a challenge of how to deal with the spent fuels. Then uh, uh, additionally, so how many light water reactors will use MOX? In order to reduce the, the plutonium stockpile, then we have to use the MOX fuel in uh, the reactors. So the question is uh, when the, uh, and how, how, how many uh, light water reactors which could use uh, the MOGs be restarted. And uh, in, in, uh, there is a, a you know, prospect that the two uh, uh, the reactors in OMA, which uh, use it's a one ton of MOGs uh, every year, would be kind of restarted sometime, you know, several years' time. And uh, if that happens, then uh, you know the, the Japanese nuclear community expects that the other uh, stockpile of plutonium will be reduced, and then. Uh, but maybe probably what we have to also discuss and think more seriously is about political and international context uh, of the other uh, or in which the our uh, nuclear fuel cycle program is located. Um, this is a uh, sort of my view on how difficult it is to solve this uh, plutonium disposition problem. I would uh, characterize this trilemma. So on one hand, there is a particular international pressure on the meeting the non-proliferation requirements. But then uh, on the other hand, at home, there is a, a sort of pressure, demand for the nuclear power from the viewpoint of the economic recovery. So there is a kind of a strong interest for the restart of nuclear power. But on the other hand, uh, you know, because of the, the, the question of disposition of spent fuel, the problem of delay in operation of local reprocessing may cause some concern. So this is sort of three interlocking factors which is a kind of exist in the, uh, uh, the Japanese fuel cycle program. And on top of that, actually Japanese Atomic Energy Commission uh, set a guideline for how to handle the plutonium in August 2003, it says utilities are expected to submit the plutonium usage plan uh, annually before separation of plutonium. So uh, that means if there is no prospect for the restart in, in a relatively large scale uh, in uh, light water reactors, then uh, you know, the separation of plutonium in the, through the reprocessing may not be you know, the following. The, the guideline set by the, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission. And so overall, you know, the factors which would affect the, the decision of a Rokasho are probably divided into these six elements. And the size of the circle actually shows the importance of gravity of the issues, actually in my analysis. Uh, so uh, the local community interest that is, uh, you know, our local economy and uh, the lo lo local economy of Lokasho is so much embedded to the existence of this reprocessing and other facilities. And uh, we had an uh, election for the mayor of Lokasho village in uh, June, and then uh, actually the candidates which support Lokasho, Lokasho uh, won uh, with a big margin. I think 5,100 to 5,000. 150. So the local community is overwhelmingly support the uh, the location. Then, uh, from a national perspective, I think energy security and science and technology interests there. Uh, you know, since the uh, mid 70s, Japan has been seeking for a set, sort of a semi ingenious uh, energy sources <coughs> that is a nuclear a fuel cycle. And that is that still persists. The secondly, uh, that's why the, the, there is a kind of a logic of JMOX plus running stock of plutonium, which is necessary for uh, keeping this MOX uh, uh, program. 
And there is a kind of rationale which was claimed by the Japanese nuclear community that the uh, separation of plutonium must be started before the MOX uh, fabrication uh, plant would be operated. Then uh, the economy, uh, that is probably controversial to some extent. You know, the people are arguing about the cost of uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, nuclear energy. And uh, according to the official estimate, that is not so high in comparison with the other sources, such as uh, uh, natural LNG or uh, wind, wind power or solar power. But uh, some other private estimates shows the, uh, the cost of uh, the nuclear power is higher than these uh, energy sources. So there are some controversies over that. And then, uh, but at the same time, you know, it, there is a fact that Japanese utility companies have invested huge amount of money on this fuel cycle program. So if they stop the uh, operation of this uh, Rokasho, it's going to be a huge sunk cost of waste of money. So they have some sort of a sense that we, they should utilize it. And then the public opinion, that is, in general, are uh, very cautious about nuclear energy and much more cautious on the uh, uh, plutonium question. Uh, according to the, some uh, surveys, the, the more than majority of the uh, public are rather cautious about the restart of nuclear power plants and more uh, cautious about the uh, location. Non-proliferation, that is relatively smaller concerns as Sharon explained. Uh, you know, although plutonium balance attracts much attention among the nuclear community, but I think Japanese public are less aware of that. And then, uh, uh, but at the same time, the foreign policy establishments are interested in the maintenance of Japan's influence in nuclear non-proliferation regime. And then uh, also, you know, Japanese companies like Toshiba, Hitachi, uh, uh, producing nuclear-related uh, 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 the you know, machines are interested in maintenance, are interested in maintaining the influence in the market. So that must be uh, pursued with uh, the non-proliferation interest. So that is the non-proliferation occupies certain position in the, uh, the overall framework uh, addressing the Rokasho question. But it, it, that's consideration relatively small uh, in my view. And then uh, the political factors. You know, the, one of the urgent issues that the Japanese nuclear community is interested in is the renewal, renewal of a bilateral nuclear cooperation agreement with the United States, which is up to 2018. And uh, the, the, they are curious, you know, how the, the status of Rokasho would affect uh, either positively or negatively on the renewal of nuclear cooperation agreement. Oh, and then. Uh, about the re retaining the latent nuclear capability, nuclear weapon capability. I guess in my observation, that part is relatively small. You know, occasionally our politicians touch upon the, the issues of technology, other technological, what's that, deterrence? Yeah, right. I know one of the deterrence. prominent politicians mentioned that the, we should maintain technological deterrence, that is to say the latent nuclear capability. but. Uh, that, I don't think that becomes a sort of mainstream discussion in the Japanese uh, you know, community. The, so please rem remember the size of circles. Uh, that's a Japan's perspective. And this is, uh, I think, what I see as an American perspective. Yes. You know, non-proliferation <laughs> occupies a really a big part of the, uh, this uh, framework. I, I, you know, please, I, I think I should ask uh, the Dr. Fetter to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this is a kind of overwhelmingly, uh, you know, the interest of uh, Japan's plutonium uh, question. So, but on the on part of the economy, I think economic rationale is one of the also important issues that is, t you know, raised by the American experts. So if the, uh, our fuel cycle program is not economically rational enough, then you know, it is natural for us to give up the nuclear fuel cycle. But on the other hand, maybe Japanese experts claim, you know, the maybe eco economy does not matter so much in front of the, the urgent needs for the uh, energy security. So it's a kind of a, you know, the, not a conflict, but uh, the difference in views and priorities between economy and the 
uh, nuclear security, uh, no, no, uh, energy security. And then uh, non-proliferation. I, I think uh, many of you are concerned about Japan's nuclear option. And also, uh, if uh, J Japan is allowed to pursue the nuclear fuel cycle, what would be the impact on the overall non-proliferation regime? And finally, I think the, uh, the consideration is about the overall US-Japan relationship, in particular, the impact on the alliance, and also, once again, the renewal of nuclear cooperation agreement. So then we have discussed three options uh, about our, our uh, low cash policy. One is business as usual. So uh, that's the, uh, what the Japanese government is trying to pursue. Uh, you know, start low cash with some prerequisite. So we talked about what are the necessary conditions uh, to be accepted uh, for, for, the, 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 for the option of business as usual accepted. So first of all, I think they have to restart the, the, uh, the light water reactors, which could use MOCs. And then uh, plutonium stockpile must be remain at an appro uh, you know, appropriate and acceptable level. The thirdly, uh, effective measure for solving the interim storage question, uh, you know, for example, the seeking and the dry cask storage. At this moment, this option is not really accepted under the agreement between local community and the utilities. So that, that must be something which we have to take into account. The second option is principled uh, restraints. So that is more cautious approach to the, at the start of Rokkasho. And then uh, finally, the repurposing Rokkasho. Although you know, the maybe Japan could, could start Rokkasho, but purpose is not just simply only for the the, the separation of plutonium from domi for the domestic purposes, but what about uh, you know putting this into international <laughs> services? Then there are some sort of limitations. First of all, capabilities, the, the capacity of reprocessing, and also the cost. Cost factor is important. Who will be the customers for such expensive services? Then uh, you know, of course, the, you know, can Korean join? the Japanese led the program. And then what about the public acceptance of local community? And finally, uh, you know, in, in general, we think that there's some keys, key factors for the policy decisions. But foremost important is transparency and accountability to reassure international community. And also for domestic audience, I think more important is economic rationality and local interest. So they are actually contradicting each other, in particular because there is a strong urgency from the local community for the starting Rokkasho or operating nuclear power plants in general uh, because they are highly dependent on uh, the uh, you know, nuclear facilities. So you know, I think it is a difficult puzzle for the, our government to solve. But uh, at least you know, I think the Japanese government and the utilities could do more about increasing the transparency of its program and the plausibility of the, the, this uh, plan, which is suggested by the Japanese government, and then uh, uh, make more commitment to the non-proliferation and uh, the explain how to minimize the, the proliferation risk of the program. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nobu. I love your circles. We may <laughs> go back to that. Steve, the floor is yours. Okay, well, I, uh, I will also focus on the reprocessing program because I think it has much larger implications for the future of the nonproliferation regime than uh, Japan's enrichment program. Uh, as all of you know, enrichment is absolutely necessary to produce uh, low enriched uranium for. Uh, most of the world's reactors, all the reactors in Japan, all the reactors in the United States, there's a powerful economic rationale uh, for Japan to have enrichment. There is no uh, rationale for reprocessing, no economic or technical rationale. Um, and uh, enrichment produces uh, low enriched uh, uranium, LEU, which cannot be used in a nuclear weapon and uh, reprocessing produces plutonium that can be used directly in a nuclear weapon and poses unique risks of, uh, of uh, theft and terrorism. And you, you see, you've seen the stockpiles, the 11 tons of separated plutonium in Japan, the 36 tons of separated plutonium in uh, uh, Japanese, separated plutonium in Europe. 
I think it's uh, also useful to state those in different terms. The 11 tons in plutonium is enough for about, the 11 tons of plutonium in Japan is enough for about 2,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, the 36 tons in Europe is enough for another five to 6,000 uh, nuclear weapons. The Rikasho uh, plant, when operating at full capacity, would produce eight tons a year of, uh, of plutonium, which is enough for over 1,000 nuclear weapons a year. So these, these stockpiles are large and uh, greatly in excess of civilian needs. And that was true even before Fukushima, but it's certainly even more true, even more obvious uh, today. And uh, in the wake <coughs> of, of the accident, uh, there's no realistic plan for Japan to use the output, the full output of Rokasho. So if Rokasho operates, uh, particularly if it operates at full capacity, the uh, stockpile of plutonium is almost certain to grow. And that, those stockpiles generate three kinds of concerns, I think. The first is that neighboring countries, you know, countries just tend to make worst case assumptions uh, about other countries. And they can see growing <coughs> Japanese plutonium stockpile, particularly one with no identified near-term use, as a latent nuclear weapon capability. In fact, I've attended several meetings uh, in other countries in East Asia where this concern is cited quite explicitly. Um, and to the extent that other countries take this seriously, that, that can contribute to instability and, and hedging on behalf of other countries. Uh, second, and I think more important, is that Japan's reprocessing program sets a precedent, an unfortunate precedent for other countries. Uh, Japan is the only non-nuclear weapon state, or the only state without nuclear weapons, that produces separated plutonium. And if Japan claims that plutonium separation is a vital part of its civilian nuclear power program, then that makes it difficult to persuade other countries uh, that they do not need the same technology. And double standards can exist for a time, but they can't exist forever. And other countries, like South Korea, legitimately question why they shouldn't be permitted something to do, uh, to do something that Japan is permitted to do. And South Korea's desire to revise its agreement for cooperation with the United States to permit reprocessing, they would call it reprocessing, but it, it's reprocessing, uh, is an example of how Japan's nuclear fuel cycle activities undermine nonproliferation norms. So, like Japan, South Korea argues that reprocessing provides important waste management benefits. And if South Korea began, re, uh, began reprocessing and stockpiling plutonium, it's easy to see how other countries would portray that as a security threat. And if Japan claims that reprocessing is essential, any country with spent fuel, any country that means with a nuclear reactor, can say that they too need reprocessing to manage their nuclear waste, that reprocessing is one of their inalienable rights under the NBT. So if Japan continues reprocessing without any economic rationale or any firm plans for the plutonium that's produced, this will inevitably undermine negotiations with countries of proliferation concern, like Iran. And in fact, under the last government in Iran, they would cite um, Japan as an example of uh, nuclear fuel cycle development that they wanted to emulate. And of course, this was the reason why the United States decided to abandon reprocessing 35 years ago to help persuade other countries to forego reprocessing. Any country with reprocessing, any country with stocks of separated plutonium is a virtual nuclear weapon state, able to build nuclear weapons very quickly with almost no warning. The existing of the existence of such a situation is destabilizing because it can prompt rivals to take steps to hedge against a rapid move to go nuclear. So the third concern, which I think is even more important, or maybe the most important of the three, is a concern about the theft of nuclear materials. And I'm particularly concerned about the physical security of MOX fuel in transit and at reactors in storage in Japan. A single MOX fuel assembly for a boiling water reactor contains enough plutonium for two nuclear weapons. A single MOX fuel assembly for a pressurized water reactor contains twice as much plutonium, enough for four nuclear weapons. And uh, I'm sorry to report that it would not be technically difficult for 
train terrace to separate that plutonium. Unlike spent fuel, MOX fuel poses no significant external radiation hazard. Once the pellets are extracted from the fuel rods, chemical separation can be done in a glove box. And in fact, the chemistry is straightforward and used to be detailed on a web page. Fortunately, someone took that web page down. <laughs> but with the Internet Archive, of course, you can always look it up. Now, some people claim it would be impossible for terrorists to build a nuclear weapon with this plutonium. And again, I'm very sorry to report that that is simply not true. And even if they were uh, not able to build a nuclear weapon, uh, they could disperse plutonium throughout a city, uh, resulting in major economic damage. So uh, Sharon said at the, at the workshop, uh, she asked, uh, people say, well, what, what is their preferred solution? So my preferred solution would be for Japan to declare an indefinite moratorium on the separation and use of plutonium. That would deal a fatal blow to claims by South Africa and I think any other country that they uh, needed reprocessing. Um, and for the US and Japan to work together on spent fuel um, storage and disposal, and the disposal also plutonium. Uh, the UK and France could agree to take responsibility for the disposal of Japan's plutonium stocks in Europe. But I understand that's not likely to happen. And so I think the next best option I, was the second option on one of the last slides. And that would be for the, Japan to take seriously its 20-year-old pledge not to produce surplus plutonium. That is plutonium beyond the amount that is necessary for its nuclear power program. The amount of plutonium currently stockpiled in Japan, not to mention the amount stockpiled in Europe, is far in excess of what's required, even if Japan restarted all of the, license, all of the reactors that are licensed to burn MOX fuel. So I, I would hope that, um, I'm happy that the restart of Rokasho has now been delayed again. I think that helps to relieve this problem of, um, of growing plutonium stockpiles. Uh, but I would hope that Japan would commit not to operate Rikasho, not to separate any additional plutonium until its stockpile of plutonium is reduced to a minimum working stock and existing plutonium stocks fabricated into MOX fuel and loaded into licensed reactors as they become operational. So reprocessing would only be restarted when plutonium stockpiles have been reduced to a minimum working stock and then plutonium would only be produced at the actual rate needed, or the rate needed to meet actual demand for reactor fuel. And given the likely reduced demand for MOX fuel uh, in the coming decade or so, uh, the restart of Rikasha could, I think, be delayed many years. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Steve. We will um, start off our discussion amongst ourselves for a little bit. Um, and so I wanted to start off with two questions. Um, one is this issue of running stock. <laughs> What's, you know, when you sit with industrial guys, they will say, well, we don't look at separated, we don't look at it in terms of non-proliferation, how many nuclear weapons it is. We need for the MOX fuel fab four tons of plutonium to be sitting around to, so that we can operate this plant in a, a reasonable or an efficient manner. So that was one issue that came up um, in Tokyo. And I kind of feel like the two communities are talking past each other. It, you know, is it possible to do MOX fuel fabrication and reprocessing in a, in a safe, secure, I don't mean safe in terms of nuclear safety, but in terms of non-proliferation. Is, is that even possible because these plants are so large? So, Steve? Well, I'm, I'm, first, I'm not convinced that four tons is a minimum working stock. But even if it is, there are about four tons already of, se of separated uh, plutonium as MOX. So the working stock is there. Right. Uh, there's 36 tons of additional. <laughs> separated plutonium that could be uh, provided, that could be shipped uh, to Japan uh, to provide a, you know, working stock at, yeah, after the JMOX plant opens. And so that, you know, this is another 
um, factor is that there's really no reason to produce any additional plutonium until JMOX is operating and producing, is drawing down the, the stock of, um, the existing stock of separated mm -hmm. plutonium. And what about the domestic issues, right? My understanding right. in Aomori is that if they don't start up Rakasho, that some of that spent fuel has to be sent back to utilities? Nova? Yes. Uh, two things about this uh, working stock, running stock. M the explanation I got from the company is that after the separation of plutonium, it will take two to three years before they are going to make a mock with this plutonium. Bef uh, their explanation is that uh, they have to actually uh, analyze the, the composition of isotopes in the, uh, this plutonium, which is dif uh, different for every uh, you know, rod. And th that's one thing. So then with this uh, you know, uh, what's it, isotope composition, they have to apply for the uh, uh, sort of a permission of uh, making a MOX fuel to the authorities. So that process takes the years. You know, I, that's what I got as an explanation. Oh, well. Japan, Japan mastered uh, just-in-time delivery <laughs> in uh, other industries. I think uh, this sounds more like an excuse than a right. real technical requirement to me. But uh. Well, anyway, that's the thing. But, uh, what, that's, because I'm not a scientist. Uh, you know, I'm a least scientific, sci you know, I'm in, you know, doing a least scientific science. Which is a political science, <laughs> so uh, wait a minute. You know, don't don't expect me about accuracy and technology, though. But the, uh, with regard to the politics, um, well, as I said, the uh, the space for the uh, uh, spent fuel uh, stock on site is now getting small and small. So uh, then they have to relocate the spent fuels. But the, the, in, so interim storage space for the Rokasho is almost nothing, and uh, they are making uh, another interim storage in so-called Mutsu, the second one, but that is used only for the TEPCO and uh, what's it, Nihon Genden, it's a, uh, a, Nihon, a Nihon Genden, it's a Japan nuclear, what's that? I don't know. Nuclear power company. Oh, okay. company. Uh, so they have to make a rearrangement, either with this uh, Mutsu interim storage or with the local community or hosting nuclear power plants to allow them to sort of, uh, uh, to allow the utilities to store the, uh, the spent fuel in a dry cask. So uh, that kind of a political process may be that sort of a difficult one. Uh, you know, in particular, the, uh, the utilities are still struggling with, uh, to get permission for the restart. And then uh, the approval from the, the prefecture is a very important process now at this moment. And so the, the amendment of arrangement with the local community probably a big task. So that's, why, that's one of the reasons why uh, utilities are hoping to sort of uh, restart Lokasho and uh, reduce the, the stockpile for the spent fuel in, in as well. Mm -hmm. if, if I could just comment on that, yeah. uh, Japan is going to have a spent fuel storage problem regardless of, of when Rokasho uh, right. or if Rokasho operates, particularly now that the restart has been delayed to 2016 in full operation until 2019. And uh, there are, there's an obvious solution to that, as you mentioned. It's dry cask storage, which is cheap and safe. And that dry cask storage could be at the reactor sites, as you mentioned, but it also could be at Rakasha. Mm. And that would, uh, that would provide um, a, a function for Rakasha, an important function. Now, I know that there are political difficulties there, too. But right. uh, um, this is a, you know, a straightforward uh, technical uh, option that has uh, been widely deployed in other countries, including Germany and the United States. Well, the another a uh, critical issue with regard to local politics is that if the government decide not to start Rokasho, then the, uh, the, the, for, uh, the spent fuel stored in Rokasho could not be utilized. So 
they now Rokasho village accept the spent fuel as a potential resource. But if it seems to be exist as a resource, then the maybe worry from the Rokasho is that the Rokasho could be the location for the final disposition. And the, so that's, I think, uh, you know, you know, I, I'm not really you know, supporting uh, this idea, but just explain. I do. Right? If I could just add one more thing. I mean, I understand the politics of this, but sort of from a technical point of view, it's, it's not very logical because uh, all Rikasha will do is separate the plutonium from the high-level waste, and the high-level waste remains at Rikasha. There is no final disposal developed in Japan. So Rikasha, by default, but de facto, is a at least long-term repository for most for the radioactive waste that's generated by reprocessing. So to a technical person, it's illogical to say, I won't store spent fuel, but I will store all the radioactive waste that's generated by the reprocessing of that spent fuel. If you're willing to do the second one, you really ought to be able to do the first one, and it's just a matter of the price that people are willing to pay. But to make your head hurt even more, <laughs> There's a, almost a financial accounting issue to this, and that is when spent fuel goes from being an asset to a liability, because it's not going to be reprocessed, right? Then that apparently affects the balance sheets of these utilities. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly the entire legal ramifications, but um, you know these the the interplay of costs and and laws and all these local restrictions is is pretty intense, and I don't think that American uh, maybe policymakers understand that, but the American public I think doesn't have a good sense of that. I have um, an, another question on the the uh, Japan Atomic Energy Commission's agreement or whatever it is with the utilities, right? Which is you need to give us an annual plan for how you're going to utilize this plutonium. So this has been going on for a long time. Yeah, um, that was agreed in 2003. Right, and every time I pose this question, I seem not to get an answer, which is, so, so the Japan Atomic Energy Commission has no real legal authority over the utilities, right? It can't say, okay, we're not gonna start reprocessing unless your plan is good enough. So what is actually the function, or how is that viewed in, in Japan? Is that a reassuring thing? Well, I think before Fukushima, uh, I think there are some sort of uh, room for the maneuvering on how to explain the delay in the, the program or starting the Rokasho and uh, the, you know, the suspension of uh, Monju, which caused the sort of uh, Problem of accountability or, or the gap between the plan for the use of a plutonium and the mounting stock stockpile of plutonium, but I think uh, that because the situation probably changed after the Fukushima nuclear accident. So uh, when they actually, uh, will submit the actual plans for the usage of plutonium, that will be put under the very strict scrutiny, in, in particular of the public. And uh, I think the, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission may face the sort of uh, strong pressure from the public about this accountability question. So um, I think it is really a big thing for the utilities to make a plausible, acceptable plan for uh, the usage of plutonium, and in particular with the MOX. So that definitely eventually will be affected by the, uh, the pace of approval from the Atomic Energy uh, so no, Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the restart of uh, power plants, in particular, which could, be, which could use the MOX fuel. Mm -hmm. Emma, I, wanna, I want you I'm to jump in lot. here. Yeah. <laughs> On the, so so the, this question of costs, um, we hear that you know importing natural gas and energy is, you know, done terrible things to Japan's trade deficit. Um, to to what extent is the current 
dissatisfaction with the Abe government? Or, you know, how does that play into that current dissatisfaction? Or is it just that the was it the consumption tax was raised recently? I mean, do these bigger questions really affect Japanese public opinion, or are they like American consumers, where you know, like if the price of gas goes down, then we forget that every other political issue <laughs> in our country. Um, Nobu can probably um, jump in here if I'm wrong, but um, I mean, certainly the economic recovery and 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 Japan's you know sort of quest for economic growth uh, weighs heavily in, in Japanese voters' minds. But at least to me, it seems like this whole notion of Japan's need to restart and uh, its reactors and to go back to the, the goals of, of what percentage you know, of, of its electricity is going to be generated by nuclear power doesn't seem to be a major part of that conversation. I mean, you hear a lot more about these other structural reforms and, and other measures that um, the Abe government has taken, and it seems it's been a little divorced, at least. Like, at the top, at least, there hasn't been a lot of leadership exerted in making the case for why this is particularly important. Um, I don't know. You have yeah. a different view? Well, yes. Uh, I think I agree with you. But on top of that, I think the, uh, the, the it seems to me that Mr. Abe doesn't mobilize his political capital to speed up the, the, the approval process for the restart. And I think the behind it, this is probably that the Japanese people are getting used to paying higher price for the electricity. Now the price for the electricity now is 30 to 40 percent higher than it used to be before the Fukushima nuclear accident. But we, you know, we could survive. But at the same time, the, the, uh, the exchange rate for yen is getting weak. And it used to be a dollar to 85, but now dollar to almost 120. And then uh, our natural gas price is four times higher than the Americans. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, I think annually, our trade deficit keep on increasing. And at this moment, I think uh, 50 or 60 billion US dollars in trade deficit. And that affects the current balance as well. And we have, as you know, you know how much, like 100 billion US dollars in a Japanese government bond issues issued. Mm -hmm. And so if uh, our, our current balance gets much worse, that may affect the credibility of JGB as well. So this uh, you know, fi you know, financial uh, sort of calculation may effect in the long run. So uh, although the trade deficit is not solely uh, caused by the, the increase in the import of natural gas, but, uh, but more about uh, you know, transfer of our production capability to offshore sites, but uh, still, the, the, to some extent, the large portion of trade deficit must be caused by the, uh, the, sort of, you know, the, uh, uh, the nuclear power plants sort of a suspension. So uh, that is one of the issues which I think, I, I, in my view, the Japanese government need to address properly. But as I said, I think Mr. Abe is a little bit cautious about addressing this question because it may cause some sort of political you know, uneasiness for him. Mm -hmm. And it is easier to pin it right on this consumption tax increase. I mean, right. it's a big jump from 5 to 8%. Mm -hmm. so. Other issues you all want to raise before I open the floor to our audience? Okay. Sir, please uh, identify yourself. There are microphones in the back. Sergey uh, Kostyev, Financial University, Moscow, Russia. I have uh, two questions. Uh, very quick. Uh, first one, uh, uh, what's around with uh, Japan being nuclear state? For instance, uh, nuclear weapon had a very positive effect on U.S. and Russia relations. There were no open war between U.S. and Russia. Also, nuclear weapon was uh, pretty positive for uh, Pakistan and India. After both uh, states uh, got nuclear weapons, there were no border conflicts, right? And second question, some people in Moscow think that uh, Prime Minister Abe is uh, pretty right-wing, and he is trying to distance himself from um, Washington. 
So is it possible he might uh, make a decision to create a nuclear weapon? Thanks. There, there were two questions in there. What was the first one? <laughs> What's wrong with uh, Japan to have a nuclear weapon? <laughs> What's wrong with Japan to have a nuclear weapon? Yeah. Should I start? <laughs> 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 well, Japan is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, so it has actually said it wouldn't uh, uh, develop nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could give you 20 reasons here. Um, regionally destabilizing, uh, it doesn't need nuclear weapons, it's under the U.S. Uh, extended deterrent. Um, I think that given the state of politics in the region um, in the last couple years, that development would be extremely, extremely destabilizing. Um, but I'm just starting here. Uh, uh, <laughs> would Nobu or yeah. Steve or even Emma want to continue? Okay. <laughs> sure. Go right ahead. Yes, on what's wrong with Japan going nuke. Uh, I, you know, I think that this legal, legal issue may have a little impact, but more substantial thing, you know, that, that those who actually claim that no problem, saying that because Japan is an important country for the world, so even though Japan would go nu nuclear, then uh, many countries would not stop the, their relationship with Japan. That's why no big deal. But at the same time, I think if Japan keep, keeps on behaving as a rational state, uh, you know, we are benefiting from uh, behaving rationally within existing international uh, system, then if we behave, as long as we behave rationally, we are not able to make a kind of strategy with the nuclear weapons to defeat the enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, probably Japan, you, you may need only 10 or you know, dozen of warheads to destroy Japan. Then how can we compete with some neighboring countries with a, you know, big land and with the strategic depths? So we are able to build a strategy with nukes to win the, the game. So, so our only strategy is to behave irrationally. But our irrational behavior may cause uncertainties uh, on our partners in trade and other international businesses. So that eventually undermines the, uh, the, our national interest in the wrong run. You know, if we are playing just one, one time game of a nuclear exchange, then we may be able to do something. But uh, you know, the, the politics of diplomacy is kind of repetition, so many repeating so many things. So I think only way for us to survive in this international system is to behave rationally. So as long as we stay rational, then uh, option of nuke is not the uh, you know, best scenario for us. I also don't see a lot of indication of Abe actually trying to move away from the United States. I mean, we've seen him emphasize again and again that the US-Japan alliance is, is um, really the sort of you know, foundation of his international outlook in the security world. Steve, do you want to add? Well, I, I agree. I just don't think it's in Japan's sec long-term security interest. I think, uh, you know, it wouldn't stop with Japan having nuclear weapons. Japan would have to ask itself, is it better off uh, with it having nuclear weapons if all of its neighbors then respond correspondingly, China, Korea, and so, and so on? I think the answer is Japan is better off as it currently. Mm -hmm. uh, right in front here. Wait for the microphone, please. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, Washington-based researcher. <clears throat> if I could follow up on uh, the question that was just asked and phrase it this way. If I were to try and make sense to myself of what Japan is actually doing overall in terms of uh, this nuclear question, I would say that they are trying to preserve a breakout capability in nuclear weapons. For example, a retired uh, Japanese vice admiral spoke recently at SAIS, and he was also former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency in Japan, and said, the moment the US nuclear umbrella is no longer there, we are becoming a nuclear weapon state immediately. Well, they can't become immediately unless they're ready to become immediately. So 
uh, whether it's a correct calculation or not, my opinion is their calculation is they're going to be ready for that should that happen. But I agree with you, the actual policy is to plan on that umbrella being there and to increase the uh, security relation with the U.S. But uh, so I don't know if there's a question there. I hope there is. <laughs> question up front and then back to Florence. Pierce Corton with the American Association for Advancement of Science. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, in the nuclear energy uh, strategy of Japan at the moment envisages uh, nuclear energy for base load uh, possibilities, which implies uh, perhaps shifting more and more into renewables. And I've noted in the, in the press that Japan is now number two with uh, solar energy uh, after China. And, the U.S. is now third. Um, has there been any uh, thought that some of these major uh, heavy-duty industries like uh, Hitachi uh, might move into developing uh, energy storage so that uh, you might use renewables uh, as a basis for uh, the baseload uh, uh, requirement and uh, not restart nuclear reactors at all? Nobu, do you have? Well, does anybody have a? I don't actually not not details, but I'm, I'm aware that some companies are trying to develop the more reliable batteries with a large sort of a large capacity. But I don't think this R and D would not meet that sort of a timeline for the restart. And I don't I don't think uh, for the time being, for the next uh, decade or so, probably uh, solar power cannot be cannot replace the nuclear energy. I think. Yeah, grid scale energy storage, electricity storage is the holy grail uh, for um, much greater market penetration by renewables, by intermittents like wind and solar. And uh, it is at a, a research stage. It's um, it, about at least a factor of five too expensive today uh, for widespread adoption. But I'm optimistic about the longer term, but that longer term is maybe uh, 10 or 20, at least 10 or 20 years away. Too expensive. Oh, I mean, even compared to the price of electricity from LNG, which is, uh, that, that would be the marginal uh, price of electricity in Japan. So the nuclear is too expensive? No, uh, existing nuclear is uh, quite cheap because the plants are already paid off. So all you have to supply is the fuel and operating. Uh, so, you know, that, that's the relevant comparison for restarting reactors. For building new reactors, there is a legitimate question about whether a new nuclear plant is, even in Japan, the cheapest uh, cost of, of electricity. Got a question back here. Florence Loli from Global America Business Institute. Good to see you, Novo. Actually, this question is to you. Uh, one of your slides, you had something about multilateralization of uh, Rokosha. Um, do you think it's visible? And also, has this been discussed formally, informally, jokingly, or <laughs> any other fashion with the Koreans? Um, actually, I, one time, I hope that the, uh, the Rokasho could be utilized for the international or multilateral purposes, you know, providing services for uh, uh, the other uh, you know, countries, in particular, after Fukushima nuclear accident, you know, we can we can foresee that all nuclear power plants could be restarted. So that means we may not need that full capacity for the, the, the usage for the domestic purposes. But because we have already got a huge amount of stockpile of spent fuel, we have to do it first. So in that calculation, I think uh, we you know Rokasho may not be able to provide a sufficient amount of capacity to serve for the, uh, the other countries uh, this, this position. And uh, then uh, with regard to the discussion with your colleagues, uh, I guess we did uh, you know, discuss a couple of times. But uh, the thing is, I know the technology that Koreans are pursuing are different from what we are doing in a, in a Rokasho. So then uh, that's one thing. The other is, you know, after the Fukushima nuclear accident, I think credibility of Japanese technology among the Koreans can kind of decreasing. And also, they are also looking at the calculation on the, uh, the cost and benefit of putting their spent fuel into the, uh, the Rokasho. But they are, I, I, in my view, they are more interested in how 
we could uh, jointly develop the way to have a sort of interim storage. And I think the common idea is maybe the interim storage within a dry cask. But I think Korea is more ahead of Japan in, in terms of the implementing a dry cask storage. Steve, did you want to answer? So I, I am not so positive about multilateralization or internationalization of Rakasha, uh, primarily because of the security concerns that I uh, stated earlier. Um, the uh, a MOX fuel assembly is just too dangerous <laughs> an object. As I said, it's uh, a fresh assembly. Uh, it's not difficult to separate the plutonium from a fresh MOX fuel assembly. And you should provide a very high level of security to any shipments, to any storage at a reactor, say in a, another country like South Korea. I would argue a level of security equivalent to that that you would provide for a nuclear weapon. So there would be the additional cost of using that, but also, and I think sort of more fundamentally, there's no economic case for providing MOX fuel uh, to any other country. The cost of producing fresh LEU fuel is less than the cost of producing a MOX fuel assembly, even if you write off the entire cost of the Rikasho plant. So this is only possible. This would only be economically attractive for another country if Japan subsidized uh, the uh, production of MOX fuel for other countries. I, I'm just not sure why that would make sense for Japan, but also it would set a very unfortunate precedent for other countries. I mean, it would just you know, basically spread uh, the use of MOX fuel without any economic uh, rationale. I would just add on the South Korea part of it, yes, we have discussed this outside of, uh, how would I call it, Tra track one and a half. So some government officials have been there, but uh, it wasn't US government officials <laughs> who were proposing it. I got the sense from the South Koreans that it was a very political issue. They were not going to be doing this. But the other problem is, and I would characterize it a little differently, I think, than, than, well, actually, let me build on what you said, Nobu. The South Koreans are interested in pyroprocessing, but they're also interested in using that, you know, using that plutonium in their future fast reactors. And so the idea that you would send spent fuel to Rikasho, and then you were going to send plutonium back to South Korea, <laughs> is not something, I'm not sure everyone's thought through all the implications of that. And you know, when Taiwan is now considering sending its spent fuel to Arriva, it's not gonna get that plutonium back as far as I can tell. I mean, I don't think all the details have been worked out. I'm not sure there's a contract there yet. But I, Miles, I saw your hand up. Were you gonna comment on this? Or you had a separate question. OK, then I'm going to go to Ryan, because his hand was up first, and then we'll come to you, Mats. Hi, I'm Ryan Schaefer. I manage Japan programs at the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. Uh, I've got two questions I hope to slip in, and they're probably both directed at Professor Akiyama. Uh, first one sounds simple. I think the answer might not be. but. Uh, what incentive at this point do the utilities have to burn MOX fuel? And in, compared to the incentive, the very strong incentive that they have just to get these plants up and running to begin with, because MOX uh, usage in the past has been quite controversial, even in Japan. Um, question number two is, I think some of the subtext to a few of the comments uh, that you made on Rokasho was that there's the possibility of restarting Rokasho at a reduced throughput. Uh, but that, that will raise the price of operating Rokasho, the, the per unit price of the MOX that's, that's generated. Uh, that price in the beginning was, was meant to be passed on to consumers, but Japan is deregulating the electricity system. So, so who, who pays for that? If it's an investment in, in energy security for Japan, it, why should the Japanese ratepayers be paying, or, or, or is it a tax? What happens there? Thank you. I think it's a very good question. And uh, as far as I hear, 
the, uh, uh, the, from uh, the people in the utility or utility companies. I'm aware of uh, some differences in their positions. And in particular, they are supporting the uh, fuel cycle program. And then uh, they have invested a huge amount on the facility. So well, on one hand, they would like to utilize the, the, the facilities. But at the same time, you know, they are concerned about keep on paying high price under uh, the very strong competitive environment which would be emerging after the deregulation of the, the electricity market. So uh, yes, uh, it is a very difficult question for utilities. In particular, among the utilities, they have different level of healthiness of their balance sheet. And some of the other companies may face a real challenge after the deregulation of the electricity market. So, uh, you know, I don't know what happens. So I'm also looking, not looking for, I would like to see actually what happens, you know, after the, you know, that there is sort of a reform of a Japanese electricity market. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there is a kind of strong interest among the nuclear engineers and scientists for the quest for sort of a completion of technology or this uh, you know, technology paradigm. And also that they don't want to waste their invest investment. Right? And so you know, that's probably beyond the economic rationality, but still I think there is a strong interest in that pursuing the problem. Did you want to add anything, Steve? Or? Well, it's, it's not directly related, but maybe a word about fast reactors and the sort of underlying economic, uh, underlying rationale for the program originally. Perfect. Want... Let, let, me, let me say this one sentence because I, I think that the disconnect between views is so, I, I was quite surprised by this. When we talked about repurposing Rikasho, some of our participants said, yes, yes, we're repurposing it. We're not, you know, separating plutonium for fast reactors. <laughs> That's right. And some of us said, Oh, okay. Um, so, so that's just a lead yeah. into your comment. <laughs> so it is important to remember that at one time there was a stronger rationale, uh, technical and economic rationale for the reprocessing and plutonium use program. But this all started in the late 60s and early 70s when it was believed that electricity demand was going to grow quickly, that much of that demand would be met by nuclear power and it's not just in Japan, around the world, there were uh, forecasts of very rapidly growing nuclear capacity. At the same time, it was believed that uranium was relatively scarce, and therefore to supply a large fraction of the world's electricity with nuclear power, you'd have to go to breeder reactors. So that was the foundation of the program. Mm -hmm. The three things happened <laughs> over the last 40 years. Uh, the first is that electricity demand and in particular, nuclear power did not grow nearly as fast as was imagined. The second thing that happened is uranium was found to be much more abundant than was originally believed, and other uranium suppliers have come onto the market. And the third thing that happened was breeder reactors were, uh, the experience with breeder reactors has been very poor. They've been much more expensive than light water reactors, and their safety and operational record has been you know, very poor. So if you were to redo the analysis today, uh, I think there would be, there would be no reason uh, to start down this road. Of course, having started down the road, then you think of, well, things you can do with this capability. Like We have all this plutonium. We have a reprocessing plant. What are we going to do with it? We're going we're gonna to fuel our light water reactors with MOX, and this is justified for energy security and waste disposal. But uh, for energy security, it's good to keep in mind that it takes, you have to reprocess seven tons of light water fuel to produce one ton of MOX. So you can only reduce your demand uh, for LEU by one eighth through this strategy. So that is not a powerful uh, a motive. And uh, on, on the waste side, uh, I guess I will just assert, I'm happy to answer any questions, that there is no waste disposal advantage to the use of MOX fuel in light water reactors. Uh, the eventual waste disposal burden is determined more by heat, 
then by volume, uh, Japanese utilities often cite the reduction in volume. That's really not a relevant metric. And in fact, the heat put, the heat output of the spent MOX fuel plus the radioactive waste is higher than the original light water uh, fuel. So there really is no waste disposal advantage. Miles, do you have a question? So microphone up here. Um, question, I, I guess, probably for all of you. Um, the, in your discussion, um, and also more generally in, in Japan, has there, has there been any thought to um, using Fukushima as an interim storage site? <laughs> well, I think it's too politically sensitive, isn't it? <laughs> you know, there, 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 it's too radioactive, Miles. I mean, <laughs> you know, who's going to object? I mean, no one's well, there. There are actually are some ideas that the, uh, you know, the Fukushima Daini or number two or some other places uh, should be utilized to, for, for some purposes. But uh, I think there are only interim storages for the waste uh, from uh, Fukushima uh, Daiichi power plants but, or uh, for, for the storage of the, uh, the soil removed for the for for decontamination but i don't think the uh you know the using fukushima as a kind of a, a space for the storage for other facilities that's probably politically incorrect in the japanese context <laughs> sorry so a, a question back here alan and then dan and then this gentleman Hi, um, Alan Ahn from Global America Business Institute. Uh, just a question for all of you. On this topic of nuclear security concerns over MOX fuel, uh, I mean, given that there's also this stockpile concern uh, with plutonium, um, what other immediate term disposition pathway does Japan have? Obviously, absent a, a fast reactor program, I understand that MOX is an I ideal but at the same time, how does Japan sort of address, um, you know, the international concerns over its stockpile? And um, just a comment about Korea, uh, you know, Sharon brief, briefly mentioned there is this interest in pyroprocessing in Korea. Uh, pyroprocessing jointly separates plutonium with other transuranics that are radioactive. So at least on the nuclear security front, um, there would be less concerns about thefts by, by non-state actors, or at least that risk would be more mitigated. So just, uh, I would just like to get everyone's opinion on, on what they see. Um, if MOX is not, not the option, then what, what ideally does Japan pursue? Would you like, who would like to take that? On the MOX thing? Well, I, you know, I, I think the preferred option for the disposition of spent fuel is what the United States has been doing and, and, and continues to do, which is to store it pending the development of a permanent repository. Now, all the separated plutonium, what, <laughs> what to do with that? Um, as you know, the US has its own problem with separated plutonium from the dismantlement of nuclear weapons. And uh, we unfortunately decided to build a MOX a plant in South Carolina uh, to, to deal with that problem. That plant is so far behind schedule and over budget that it may be abandoned. Uh, there may be other ways of just disposing directly of plutonium in deep boreholes. This is always an option that I thought deserved a closer consideration. About alternative uh, methods of reprocessing or disposition like pyroprocessing, I think you need to do a careful assessment of the, of the actual process. Uh, there have been a few studies done of this which suggest that the security benefits are not as large as might be imagined. It really depends on exactly what the product <coughs> is. So a number of uh, processes that the US had been investigating 
where other transuranics are separated along with the plutonium, produce a product that is not very radioactive and is directly usable in a nuclear weapon. It's a lot more radioactive than plutonium, but if you're a terrorist, uh, you may not care if you get a dose that's above the level recommended for the public. You may be willing uh, to accept a, a much higher dose. So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, and, and then the other half of this assessment, though, is what that technology can also be used for. Uh, one of the U.S. concerns about pyroprocessing for technology for other countries is that same technology could be used to produce pretty pure plutonium. So even if the proposal is to produce a somewhat dirty mixture that would be more hazardous uh, to handle, the same technologies can be used to produce uh, a much purer product. Okay, we have a question oh. up here, Dan. Sharon, oh, I'm on sorry. The, uh, oh, it's a nu nuclear security question, a, a counterterrorism thing. Uh, the, at, at this moment, Japanese nuclear uh, facilities are upgrading the, uh, their uh, countermeasures or sort of uh, deploying the armed forces. Uh, although there are some sort of uh, restrictions in, of the, uh, for these armed forces to access, in particular, the police forces. Uh, you know, located on the site, but the, the maybe the uh, focus is about the uh, personal reliability program. You know, the how to sort of check the background of the personnel engaged in the sort of works in on, on site, and that the, our government is in the process of uh, creating the new uh, sort of a scheme for the, the reliability program, but that's. Actually, I'm sitting in the panel, so I really cannot make a sort of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, comments really. But uh, what I can tell is the sort of a basic framework of this program is to ask to sort of uh, let utilities and other uh, companies sort of uh, check the, the workers, employees, of their backgrounds based upon various sources of information and uh, make sure that there will be no uh, you know, suspect, sort of suspicious people engaged in the uh, uh, sort of uh, work which requires access to the, the sort of restricted area. And although probably we may have to have much you know, higher level of uh, sort of security clearance system, but I think as a start, I think it is important to introduce the system first. Yeah, this is not earth shattering in the US context, but it's a pretty big deal mm -hmm. in Japan because they haven't had this kind of system before. Question right here, Dan Horner, and then in the back. Hi, Dan Horner from Arms Control today. Um, there have been conf conflicting or at least confusing accounts of what US officials have said to their Japanese counterparts on this issue and how Japanese officials have interpreted those comments. So I wonder if the panelists could shed some light on that. Maybe start with Steve Fetter, since you were in the government for a while. What, what were the interactions while you were in government and what you know of afterward? And then if the other panelists could, could add to that. Thanks. What is this? Uh, what, what, what has the US said um, regarding uh, what, concerns the US what concerns the US has about the nonproliferation implications of, of proceeding with Rikasho and the, and the whole fuel cycle program. Has the US uh, urged Japan to, to stop that, to scale back, um, and, how, and, um, and other elements of, of, its, of restarting the nuclear reactors? Well, I, I suppose there are different views within the US government. Um, and without commenting specifically on any particular message, I think sometimes a given message is heard in different ways, or people interpret it the way they'd like to. So uh, under, the, under the previous government, the decision to uh, phase out nuclear power but operate Rikasho and to produce more plutonium, that was, that was seen with some, with some alarm because uh, all that would serve to do is produce plutonium without any conceivable use. So when some US officials expressed concern about this situation, about uh, 
you know, or, or ex excess stockpiles, that, that could be interpreted as, oh, you need to use the plutonium as MOX. Or it could be interpreted as, uh, why, why, you know, why, why are you producing <laughs> this plutonium that doesn't have any, any identified purpose? So I think there is a widespread concern in the administration about the accumulation of excess plutonium stockpiles. But how you address that problem, uh, how it, I, I would say there's also a concern in the US government about the US asking Japan to do something that it can't politically do. You know, if you, you, you have to, your uh, requests have to, be reason, have to be seen as reasonable, and if they're not, it, all, all you're doing is um, uh, upsetting US-Japan relations to really no, no productive end. So I think that was another, we, you know, people wanted to highlight this concern about excess stockpiles while recognizing that Japan would have to make its own decisions about how to address that. Um, on this uh, non-proliferation uh, concerns or interest, uh, I think that is somewhat to, to do with the, uh, the classic question whether proliferation is a technical problem or a political problem. And I think the, uh, in the past, I mean, traditionally, Japanese nuclear community is pretty much dominant on the thoughts on the technicality of the proliferation. And uh, that's not really about politics. So I think the traditionally Japanese nuclear experts tend to think that as far as they uh, you know, meet the requirement of uh, the safeguards of the IAEA, that means to meet the technical sort of sufficiency of ensuring non-proliferation, then it is OK. So it's a question of necessary conditions and sufficient conditions. I think in the, currently, people consider the technical a fulfillment, fulfillment of technical requirements for safeguards is a necessary condition, but not sufficient enough. So I think Japanese are learning uh, about the ne this necessary condition, sufficient condition distinctions uh, by introducing the thoughts on the political implication of non-proliferation. So you know, uh, the Dr. Feta mentioned that the, the Iran is referring Japan as a kind of model. And then uh, what the Japanese claim is Japan model is not about the you know, full scale fuel cycle uh, as a non-nuclear non open state, but we have to add the full compliance to the IA, with the IAEA safeguards, in, uh, plus adding the sort of uh, granted status of integrated safeguards. So, uh, but that's probably still not sufficient in a sense for, for the non-proliferation experts, in particular in the United States, right? So, uh, but, um, so that's why we are talking more about sort of accountability of fuel cycle program and how they are going to use the separated plutonium in order to reduce the uh, anxieties or concerns of the international audience. This gentleman towards the back. Uh, Dr. F uh, Stapleton Roy from the Wilson Center. Uh, Dr. Fetter, you referred to the fact that plutonium stockpiles create the potential for rapid nuclear breakout. Uh, no one doubts that Japan has the technical capability for a rapid breakout. But I wonder if you could comment on the re relative speed of a breakout for a plutonium-based weapon on the part of terrorist groups or countries that do not have the technological capabilities of Japan, as opposed to a, a, a highly enriched uranium-based weapon. Well, as you might imagine, it's hard to comment in detail on that. Um, you I don't want to, but the, uh, it, yeah, it has commonly be, been assumed that a plutonium weapon is much more difficult to master than a uh, weapon that's based on HEU, because plutonium produces neutrons, and you know you have to prevent the pre-detonation of the plutonium as you assemble it. Um, but uh, th this is not, I think perhaps people have overestimated the, the technical challenge. And it, it's, it's quite unfortunate. It would be nice if, 
if nature had made it uh, more difficult. But I think we should not regard plutonium as any less dangerous um, in the, uh, as, as high enriched uranium, even for uh, terrorist use. Yes, even, even uh, the plutonium that is separated from spent light water reactor fuel. So, so I will say one thing. I think it's in our, our summary in the workshop report that uh, sometimes what you hear in conversations is, well, Japan would never use this reactor grade plutonium because that's kind of beneath them, right? <laughs> if you're going to make weapons or make a stockpile of weapons, you're going to make some nice fresh plutonium that's good weapons grade. I will say that even though uh, many of us may think, well, yes, that's true, that is, does not provide a lot of comfort uh, or, or reassurance in the long run. So one of the things that came out of this workshop is that messaging uh, is really important. And I think that uh, the way you depicted it, Nobu, the, the differences in the kind of issues that we in the U.S., at least mostly in the non-pro community, and, and the Japanese, the way that you view those different issues and the importance, that all has to be factored into um, how do you, how, how do both sides communicate with each other in a way that we're really talking to each other and, and hearing it rather than just talking past each other. We are almost out of time. I would like to give my panelists each an opportunity to make some last remarks in case there was something you didn't get to say um, before we close up. So I'll start with you, Emma. Okay. You're good? Okay. Well, you know, I, I think the issue of uh, plutonium question in Japan uh, involves both politics and technology. And uh, because probably I'm from political science background, I see more importance in politics. And I, the, in particular, that's true for the non-proliferation. But at the same time, the uh, bottom line is the importance of a very good sort of US-Japan relationship. And I think that all Japanese are aware that without a, a good bilateral relationship, they are able to even pursue the fuel cycle program. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, I'm a little bit concerned about the uh, sort of a heavy, heavy politicization of this issue at the same time, in particular toward uh, 2018. And uh, if that issue is messed up, then uh, uh, you know, I, think, I don't think that uh, is not really are healthy for overall U.S.-Japan relationship. So I would like to see more kind of a sober dialogue between Japan and the United States on the credibility of Japanese interpretation, explanation of what, what they're going to do with uh, you know, separated plutonium and uh, think about how to reduce the stockpile of plutonium. Okay. Steve, any? Well, I'd like to comment on uh, so something that uh, Nobu just uh, said about the Japanese viewing non-proliferation um, non in a very technical way, that as long as a program, as long as facilities are under safeguards, as long as a country is in compliance with its non-proliferation, it safeguards obligations that everything should be fine. I'm not sure that's really true. I think uh, that Japan would not be comfortable if uh, a dozen two dozen other countries had reprocessing programs and large stockpiles of plutonium. I think uh, Japanese policymakers recognize that this is a special and dangerous technology, that uh, the fact that it provides a latent nuclear weapons capability is in the back of the mind, but that Japan has this special status. It is the only country without nuclear weapons that's separating and stockpiling plutonium. And that was a very hard-won status. That was, that was a, a, a real point of contention. And I think having achieved that special status, I think Japan is reluctant to give it up. So I think that is a, a major factor that sort of unrecognized. Um, and the problem, of course, is that 
I think it's hard to keep this special status just for one country. That, uh, uh, you know, if, if Japan um, continues this activity, that it's inevitable that uh, other countries will want the same, the same right and privilege. Well, thank you all <laughs> for, for uh, joining us today. Thank you all for participating. Please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>